We're in Hebrews, 12th chapter. These words. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely. Let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners so that you may not grow weary or lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. The um, great author, Isaac Dennison, who wrote Out of Africa, she, this was her pen name, Isaac wasn't her real name, Dennison was her maiden name, her actual name was Karen Blixen, she said, that there are three occasions for happiness. One is excess of energy. Two is cessation of pain. And three is doing the will of God. Now, the first one, excess of energy, I find is often confined to the young. <laughs> they seem to have an excess of energy. Um, and it's wonderful, isn't it? We cut all that energy. <laughs> all right. The second one, sensation of pain, I find to be very brief. <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? It's very brief, very brief. It's nice when it comes. Oh, I feel totally good. <laughs> okay, that's nice, but it's brief. And the third one, doing the will of God, ah, that can happen at any time, at any place. No matter what's going on in your life, no matter how bad life is, no matter how much injustice is around us, we can always do the will of God. Now, this text in the in in Hebrews here, has more to do with the last two, the cessation of pain and doing the will of God. That's what we're going to focus on. Excess of energy will leave for someone else. Pain is the gift nobody wants. Dr. Paul Brand, who was a missionary physician in India, wrote the book by this title, P 
pain, the gift nobody wants. I got it back out, read it years ago for this sermon. And Dr. Brand says that pain truly is a gift. He worked with those who had leprosy. Now, I've been to Tanzania, and I actually visited a leper colony there and got to meet people with leprosy. It is not a very nice thing. You know, it's, it's called Hansen's disease. It attacks nerves, and it erodes them away from the extremities inward. And so, people who have leprosy lose feeling in their hands and feet. And their body just gets eroded from the outside in. Imagine if you placed your hand on a stove burner that was hot and you couldn't feel pain. You wouldn't know to remove your hand until you smelled your flesh burning. And that's a horrible image. But let's face it, pain is a warning system that something is wrong. And we need it. But our world seems to want to deny pain at almost all costs. If you remember years ago, the pain reliever, uh, they had a little jingle on the commercial. It went, I haven't got time for the pain. We don't. We, 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 we don't seem to have time for pain. We want to deny it. This church, which is being written to, is in Rome, and it is a church that's in pain. And it's chronic pain. Spasms of pain, I think, sometimes are easier to handle. That It's intense, but it's over. But chronic pain keeps on, and it wears people down. It can wear large groups down. It can wear individuals down because you can't seem to get away from it. This church could not seem to get away from persecution. Nero was, was, had a rampage against Christians in that day and time. And so they lost loved ones. They were, well, it was dangerous. I mean, when you walked in today to worship, you probably weren't thinking, oh, this is a really dangerous thing to do. I mean, once in a while across this land it is, but it shouldn't be. It shouldn't ever be that dangerous to worship, should it? But it is across the world in many places. But this church worried about that. So, pain is a gift that no one seems to want. How do we persevere through pain? Our faith ought to be that which helps us get through pain. 
But when we have enough of it, it can even shake our faith sometimes. So we have to watch how can we persevere through pain. I think it's helpful to realize that there are some things that intensify pain. And if we're unaware of them, we can end up adding to the pain that we can't control. which then gets us really overwhelmed. Researchers who have researched pain almost all agree. Do you know what the number one intensifier of pain is? Fear. Fear. Years ago, I was in the midst of my doctorate, and I decided to trim the tree next. It was a small tree. It's only about that high um, from that floor. And I had to get my stepladder out. It was a wooden step ladder. My brother is a safety expert. After I fell with this wooden ladder, he said, John, you are never to have a wooden ladder. It is forbidden. Only have a fiberglass stepladder. That's it. No aluminum, fiberglass stepladder. Oh, thanks, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> this, um, <laughs> this wooden stepladder I'd had for years, I'd even repaired it. Sometimes... Good stewardship is not what we think. <laughs> the ladder, I was on it, and everything happened in slow motion. The ladder suddenly went like this. And it went down. And I put my arm down to catch myself. And the stepladder went over my arm. And I went over the stepladder on the concrete. It shattered my wrist. I was in agony. Fortunately, Rebecca was there. She went in and got this little bitty ice pack <laughs> and put on this twisted arm and called, and somebody came, and they all came. <laughs> Took me to the hospital. I had to have surgery. It was so shattered, they had to piece it all back together. I got, like, you know, hardware in there. And you know what was the worst part? Fear. I was in the midst of the final parts of the dissertation. And now I thought, I can't type. My wife can't type. I'm doomed. <laughs> All right. And I kept thinking, I'm not going to be able to finish. Now, I find everyone who does higher degrees, they all think at some point, I'm not going to finish. <laughs> okay? It just goes with the territory. 
but of course I did finish. And I ended up being able to type, not great, it took longer, but it actually was sort of therapy, <laughs> and it got better. But fear intensifies pain. And these Christians are fearful they're going to lose their lives. And fear runs ahead. Fear has you dead before you're dead. Fear has you shedding blood before you shed blood. And that's why here in Hebrews, it, the author reminds them in your struggle against sin, and sin here is probably taken in this idea of corporate injustice that's surrounding the church. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. You're, you're still whole in your body. But fear takes you places you don't want to go. It is the greatest intensifier of pain. Second, can, can you guess? Here's another one. You ready for this? Loneliness. Loneliness intensifies pain because we think we're all by ourselves with it. The other day, I watched a mother trying to get her daughter into a car seat in the car. You would think that should be simple. No. This little girl was a bit stubborn. And I kept hearing her say, do it by myself. She had her hand on, the, on the, the door handle of the car. She wouldn't let her mother put her hand. She kept putting her mother's hand away. i do it by myself. And she's trying to pull on this. She can't get the car door open. Finally, her mother, they do it together. She's got to crawl up into the car seat herself. It's not going to be put in there. Then she gets in there. And I'm watching all this, okay? I know you're not supposed to be a voyeur, okay? But I couldn't help myself. I was just glad she never saw me. But anyway, I'm watching this with amusement, and she's trying to, I don't know, click it. And she can't get it because I tell you, you got to be tight in those car seats these days. And she can't get it, and it's, I'm thinking this mother will have no patience at the end of all this. But finally, you know, the, together, they, it's all done. Now, this little girl said, do it myself. And we all laugh at that. But isn't that what we do? Don't we do it? I've got to do it myself. We may have a whole church around us to help us, but no, I'll do it myself. I, I go into an airport. I'm picking up my bags, taking them. Somebody wants to help me. No, no, it's going to cost me money. That's <laughs> what I'm thinking, you know. I don't want help. Why are we this way? We torture ourselves. We add to pain. My wife is a nurse. She's a retired nurse now, was a hospice nurse. 
That's tough nursing to help people die, okay? As a nurse, she is on a social media site for nurses. I'm not on any social media because I don't want to give advice. But anyway, ah, she's on there. And a pregnant nurse throws out a question. How long did all you other pregnant nurses work? Because I'm hurting in my hips and I can't sleep very well and it's getting tough to work. And all right, you get the picture? Now, what do you think happened? Do you think there was an avalanche of compassion for this nurse? That's what I would have expected. It's what my wife expected, but no. Nurse after nurse said, I worked right up to the moment when my water broke. <laughs> One even said this, suck it up, buttercup. Why? We deny our own pain. We want to deny it. We are such a culture that doesn't have time for pain. Even when pain is telling us, rest, rest. The church is having trouble. Now, part of the reason is that they fear loss of their loved ones around them. And the writer says, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Now, the word witness here is a Greek word, and it means to testify to something, right? And so we testify to Christ. We're witnesses of Christ. We represent Christ. But the same root word also means martyr. And so you can be a witness who's either alive or, as we would say, dead. Either way. But the picture here, and th there's a, I read recently a quote by Robert Johnson. You don't have to know who he is, but this is what he said. He, he, towards the end of his life, he had a number of dreams and visions that was saying he's going to die. And he wrote, the thing I fear most about death is the loss of my friends. The loss of my friends. The loss of relationships. I think that's what this church is fearing. And it's why the writer says we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. So the picture here is of running a marathon race. And you run this marathon race, and you got to persevere to do that because it's 26-something miles along, right? And don't ask me to run a marathon, by the way, because I'm not doing it. That's too much pain, too much. But you run 26-plus miles, and then when you end, the picture in the scripture is, is that you end inside a stadium. And you can see that on the Olympics these days, can't you? These marathon runners, they come running. Where, where's the end? In the stadium. It's still the same. You run into the stadium with the other runners. So you don't run alone. You're running. You run into the stadium, 
And there's a crowd that is cheering you on, welcoming you. And this is a cloud, we could say, of witnesses. They are people who have died in the faith, and there are people who are living. And what the writer is trying to say, the veil between this life and the next is far thinner than what you think. There is truly a heavenly spiritual golden world that overlaps with this one if we could just see it. You don't ever lose a friend in Christ. Always have them. Always. That's why beforehand in chapter 11, it mentions a whole bunch of saints. Moses, Rahab, Gideon, on it goes. We're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. I may have told you this before, but one time I was preaching, and in this service, a daughter heard her mother's voice behind her singing. Only her mother had been dead for years. So she looked around to see who had her mother's voice. And her mother was standing there in golden light singing. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Now think of this. These pews then are all full. They are saints cheering us on. Persevere. Do not give up. You can make it. Third is guilt. There is sin that can ensnare us that we return to again and again and we rehearse again and again. It's called regret. We have regret over something, something we've done wrong, and, and we just won't let it go. Why is it sometimes easier to forgive others than ourselves? But Jesus paid the price for all sin, did he not? He did. And if he paid the price for sin so that we might be forgiven, then why do we take it up again? If we've confessed it, it is cleansed. And guilt intensifies pain. And so we've got to let it go. Lay aside every weight. And so, if we're going to persevere through pain, let us do the will of God. And we can do this by always considering Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. We can do the will of God, which will produce such happiness. We will, can do the will of God no matter where we are, what's going on. No one can take away our freedom of will to do the will of God. Now, sometimes people get in their minds that this sin, which is so awful, then becomes an occasion for us to sin. Now, we don't think of this exactly consciously, but it goes like it. Let me give an example. Here's one. That leader in the church is such a hypocrite. I am done with church. Have you ever heard something like that before? You've heard that before, right? People do that. Some leader, you know, messes up, does something horrible, and then so, somebody. So why, I ask you, because the one leader sins, why is that an occasion then for the other person to sin and say, I'm done with church? Is there anywhere in this scripture that says, you're allowed to be done with church if... There is, I'm sorry, you're in it forever, okay? 
This is it. We are saints together. There is no getting out. We're in it. So don't let one thing become an occasion for something else. One of the most common themes in movies these days is revenge. Revenge. Somebody hurts somebody, the other person goes back, kills them, kills a few more. It's revenge. But what does Scripture say? Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Only God has enough love to handle vengeance. We do not. It is off the table for Christians. There is no vengeance allowed for Christians. So we can do the will of God in a place where we might want to do revenge, but no, we're not going to because that's off the table. We'll do some... Have you ever regretted doing the will of God? I mean, come on. Did you ever go... I wish I hadn't said that kind word in the face of that insult. I wish I hadn't done that. No, I, I mean, we don't, reg you can't regret doing the will of God. It's all good. And so let's do it. So we consider Jesus. Jesus endured the hostility of sinners. He didn't let their sin become an occasion for him to give up. He embraced the cross and did the will of God and went ahead and won for us salvation and went ahead of us and has prepared a place for us. So let's stop as a church speaking fear. Let's not let people be lonely and let's proclaim the gospel that says that we are forgiven in Jesus' name. So I have a challenge for you this week. As a church, I want you to pay attention to how often you speak fearfully. Okay? And when you do, know that perfect love casts out fear. And I want you to quote that scripture. It was up on the screen earlier. Perfect love cast out fear. The church too often speaks fear and not faith. We are a church. We ought to be speaking faith, our deep trust in God. But if we're around the church long enough, we hear things like this. Oh, we don't have enough volunteers. Oh, that costs too much money. Oh, we don't have enough young people. Where are the children? Oh, these people don't get along. On and on we go. We speak more fear than we speak faith sometimes. Let's stop doing that. It only adds to pain. So watch our words this week, our thoughts, and let's speak not fear, but faith. Faith. Anytime you have a fearful thought, just quote this scripture. Perfect love casts out fear. And who is perfect love? It is our Lord Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Glory to God. Amen.